What the hell? Vocal. Yeah, yeah. Two, 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 two. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or are we talking? You're live. Go. Hi, folks. Okay, hi. We're live on our thing. They're behind us. Huh? They're behind us. We're, They're behind we're, us? We're, ahead. we're in the future. Okay. As usual, talking to those guys in TRI land, waiting for Roger McNamee at the Forever Festival to come on the screen and ask us questions. So I guess what we do now is kill time by uh, wishing you all out there, all you Forever Festival fans and friends, uh, a big hello from here at TRI Studios in uh, as Tamil Pius Research Institute, where research is our business. Um, what kind of research are we doing, Bob? You Should know, we tell them? You want to know? We want to know. We're going to find out. Um, <laughs> now, I got my lab coat yesterday. Bob's still waiting on his. Anybody wants to send us lab coats, has suggestions, we're, we're open. Send them on. As you can see, we got some kinks to work out with, uh, with this online festival business. We're, we're waiting for, uh, for another talking head. Um, Mr. Roger McNamee should be appearing on that screen at any minute. At any minute, yeah, or on this screen as well. On that screen, come on. What's the deal here? Are we, we should we go play a song? Should I go play I a song? I don't think we have time for that. I right. mean, I can why don't you acapella something right now? Acapella something. Logger we'll song. See. Anybody want to hear logger song? Oh, uh, well, if I could get AJ over here. AJ. AJ, come here. Let's do the rat dog drinking song. Oh, there you go. <laughs> is Jay around? Nah, he's he's. he's this is my uh, this is my faithful tech, uh, Abacom. Abercrombie Johansson uh, Santella, AJ. Italian. And um, we're going to do for you the rat dog drinking song. Just the chorus? Yeah, just the chorus. Well, yeah, the chorus and the verse. Two, three. Drink, 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 drink. drink I We're going to drink, 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 drink. I We're going to drink, drink, drink. Drink and I hee. We're, We're gonna, gonna drink, 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 drink. I hee. That's how it goes. It goes on. It is, you know. There's some there's some verses involved, but that's too complicated for me. <laughs> you seem to get them all right. So, thank you, America. Okay. Well. It uh, forever. Where can I get festival. one of them fancy jackets like you got? Uh -oh. Okay, Looks wait like, a minute. Here we come, Fox. Bye bye, AJ, and there's Roger. Okay, you're going to have to. I'll interpret. Unless he's got a microphone. Maybe I can read his He's got lips. a microphone. Hey, Roger! <laughs> Roger, our speakers. Hello? Are, are way distant, so you're going to have to enunciate. You know what? They're delayed. so They're, they're delayed. Can he hear me at all? Roger, can you hear us? No. Apparently not. I'd like to know if anyone can hear us, or are we just sort of going off here? <laughs> Please tweet or Facebook. Hey, gotcha. All right. Okay, well, they got us in the control room. <laughs> Voice of God. <laughs> Next, we're going to have a contest for a new color. God hears everything. Everybody vote, vote for a new t shirt color for Bob, and he'll be sure to wear it. Actually, I, uh, well, I brought another t shirt for this event. <laughs> you know, Swiss, it, say like a Swiss watch. This is what's happening. This is working just exactly like a Swiss watch, <laughs> as, you, as you kind listeners and, and viewers out there can obviously. Um, now we had a Pretty great Elizabeth. Ascertain. We had a great Elizabeth Taylor joke, but I think we could go to oh, the yellow dog no, joke if you minute. want to tell that. Wait a minute, what was that one that uh the elephino? What do you get when you cross an elephant and a rhino? Oh, what do you get? I, I forget what. Elephino. All right. Let's see. Um, what do you get when you cross a a pig? And an octopus. I don't know. Bob. Football that throws itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. 
I, a lot of you folks have not heard this one, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this one. So anyway, a duck walks into a bar, see? And uh, hops up on the bar stool. Bartender turns around and sees him, says, can I help you? Duck says, got any flies? And the duck says, uh, uh, that's, that's what the duck says. The uh, bartender says, no, uh, we, don't, we don't serve flies. We also don't serve ducks. And I wish you'd uh, just get on out of here. So the duck leaves, kind of upset, but he comes back in 20 minutes, hops back up on the bar stool. Bartender turns around and sees him. You again. Got any flies? No, I told you, we don't serve ducks. We don't serve flies. Get out of here comes hey, back again 20 Matt minutes later. Band Moon Alice, and uh, we're now oh, oh, live, we're live. We'll over the Jeff internet Michael. with the incredible Bob Weir and Chris McCutcheon up at TRI. So guys, welcome to the Forever Fest. Why, thanks. It seems like forever. <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh, just because you're with me. Once you meet everybody else out here online, you're going to be happier about that. So guys, I love the little preview, the little intro there. Bobby, can you just give us more context? You know, there's a tremendous vision behind TRI. And it has, you know, I've, as you know, spent 30 years in the technology world. And what you have done didn't just break ground. It has a chance to really open up whole new areas of creativity. And I'd like to give you a chance, you and Chris, to talk about you know, specific examples of the things you're hoping to do with it and just let us know what you think here. Okay, first off, I gotta get somebody to get me the iPad, the, uh, the Constellation iPad. But I'll, I'll take it from here, one of our guys here. Somebody, is there anybody here? Oh, here it is, great. Um, so anyway, what we set about to do was build the ultimate playpen for musicians. And uh, we bought an old, uh, the, the place was built as a rehearsal studio, but it was built uh, pretty as a real solid rehearsal studio. The, uh, the acoustical uh, treatment here was done by uh, uh, Sam Burkow, who's kind of the Moses of, uh, of uh, 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 acoustical architects, I guess you'd call them. And um, anyway, we we took that and made it into a studio facility. There are a lot of rooms here, and a lot of the uh, some of the rooms we re redesigned a little bit more specifically to our purposes. Uh, with uh, we had a, one of our guys, uh, Dennis Leonard, um, redesigned all that stuff. The sounds, the room sounds excellent. The control room is state of the art. Um, we prefer to go to two inch tape if we can, but we've got, and we've got, uh, I think three two inch tape machines here. Um, they're old, old Studer machines. They're the best you could get, best we could find. And, um, and then in, in here in the, the studio room, what we have is, uh, I'll do a little demo here. I don't know if you can hear it, but uh, crank up the room if, uh, if you would. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the room off. And this is what the room sounds like. I don't know if you can hear this over the, uh, over the air, but now what we, what we do is, uh, we got 80 speakers around the, around the room in a soffit, you can't see them, and, and a couple dozen microphones hanging down in the room. And what the microphones do is they hear everything where it happens in the room and take it up through software and, and put it out through the speakers. And um, I'm going to, uh, so I'm gonna clap like that. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on the cathedral setting because that's the, uh, one of the biggest paydays. And um, come on, there, you go. there we go. That's the c cathedral setting. Here's another one. So that's good for weddings, uh, convocations, anything important like that. Convocations. Uh, Complications so, so, of convocations. Let's see. So Bobby, let's, let's, let's take for a moment this notion that you've created the world's definitive playpen for musicians. Obviously, you have done some tremendous innovation. You have We're Here as a 
talk show that you're doing live from the from TRI. Other people are doing tremendously innovative things. And what I'm really curious about is you put this playpen, and where do you see that going? What do you want to do with it? Because it's more than just putting it on nice tape. Well, there are a number of things we can do with it. We can, uh, we can do festivals like this. We got two studios here and a couple of other places uh, right in the neighborhood. So we could have like two, three, four stages going. And, uh, and we, could, we could actually go around the clock if we wanted to. Um, and you could go around the clock because you know, you're, you're going all over the world. Uh, another thing we can do is what we're doing here, just doing little shows or we can go one step further and do full concert shows and put them in people's living rooms and also into, uh, we were talking to some folks the other day, um, not, I don't think at liberty to, to mention who they were, but we're talking about uh, going into a chain of theaters um, and putting on a concert that originates from here but goes to a chain of theaters, um, you know, within, uh, they'd have to be times time zone friendly so maybe uh, a couple and uh, we do a concert for the uh, for the Rocky Mountain time zone and the Pacific time zone or for uh, Eastern and Central so as you and Chris have been running the business I mean one of my favorite things which my band was lucky enough to be part of is your TV show we're here tell me about how that arrived and what you're doing with that We've been doing that for how long have we been doing this? Uh, we started two weeks, so three weeks after Hurricane Sandy last year, so right around Thanksgiving time, and this is our 22nd show tonight. And so talk, talk about what the vision is for that, because, I mean, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it is, it's an extraordinary thing. It harkens back to the TV talk shows of the 50s and 60s, but it's our kind of music and our kind of people as opposed to, you know, people from the 50s and 60s. <laughs> I think what you're hitting on, Roger. What we're <laughs> right. okay. You know, it's we're trying to get all kinds of music in here. Um, and that's the fun of it. Uh, I get to play with a lot of these acts that come in through here, and that's fun. You know, because I get to play all kinds of different, all different kinds of music. And uh, you know, like for instance, tonight uh, in a little bit, you're going to see young Lucas Nelson who's, uh, you know, he's, as I have often said before, he's the greatest thing since canned beer. Um, <clears throat> but he's in his early 20s, and uh, he's got an edge that, uh, that you don't hear from guys like me often unless, uh, unless somebody sets up the pitch for us, and then, then, yeah. then things get interesting. Uh, well, to me, I think that, that they're in, Bob, I want to pursue that for just a sec, because... You know, I've been building a band over the last five, six years, and I know there are a lot of great musicians out there without a way to reach audiences. And to me, what TRI's done is give people a place you can go that is the equivalent, you know, of a breakout show or something, right? I mean, it's this is a to me, you know, we're here, and the other things that you're doing there aren't just going into a nice studio. There's something else going on here because of the brand you bring to it. And I'm just curious, you know, when you get the son of Zamfir or you get some dude who, you know, plays the, um, a ukulele with one string, you know, you get to expose them to a, all the people who'd be interested in those kinds of music. And to me, that seems like a really big deal. Well, that's one of the things we want to do with this show. And in general, I would love to see, uh, now we have to figure out how to get this going because it's kind of expensive to do. Um, so we're going to need, you know, I guess we're going to need sponsors or some sort of uh, patronage uh, to do this. Right now we're doing this on our own dime, and like I say, it gets pretty expensive. But as the, the, our audience here is, is growing, uh, you know, it's growing at a pretty good clip. And what we're hoping is that soon, we'll, you know, people with money will be interested in, uh, in funding this for I don't know for advertising or for uh, for whatever purposes, and at that point, you know, maybe funding from uh, from foundations. I don't know, but we could do any kind of. It, I think it has to be a regular show. Like mm -hmm. we do these these Wednesday night shows. We could do Thursday night shows, Monday, Tuesday, 
Um, they should be regular so people know to, to check in. And we could do different kinds of shows. We could do a jazz night, a uh, string band night, uh, uh, you know, punk night, whatever. Uh, disco night, come on. We could hang the mirrored ball. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that we could be doing. And that's kind of what I had in mind when we, we were building this place. It, while we were building this place, we didn't know what we were doing until it told us what we were going to do. And uh, so it's still telling us. How it always is, when you're doing something cool and new, right? There's no playbook, so you just, you go out there and experiment and see what happens, right? Kind of what we're up to. Yeah, so talk a little bit about what you're doing now with, um, you know, again, you said this is the 22nd episode of, of We're Here. And again, you know, you've got a really interesting format, right? You've got talk show elements, you've got music elements, but you have total control of it. And the thing that is interesting, I mean, you talk about the expense of you guys owning the studio, but the truth is the cost to produce a show for an hour is not actually very high in the venue. In fact, it's compared to, the, to me, the benefit, every band should want to be sitting there coming in and paying you a few grand just to get half an hour or something uh, in that studio because it's, uh, you know, like I said, I think you guys aren't just about the, vi the audio quality and the video quality. There's a brand association to, uh, uh, to what you're creating that at least I know in my own band I like to latch on to. Well, for a lot of the bands that we'd love to get in here, uh, they can't afford much. And the, 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 the up, you know, the overhead here is, is, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty substantial. So we have to find ways to, uh, to, you know, we haven't been doing recording here, but. Um, well, I think also, let me tap in there. If you look at the, the model here for a band, this is a completely different product where you can perform live stream to a live audience, but walk out with a product really economically that's nearly ready to go. Uh, in DVD, Blu-ray format, or audio two track, you've reached a very large audience. We average 30 some thousand uniques at an average of 32 minutes uh, every week. We do this, so yeah. that's pretty significant. How many times is a band gonna get that kind of exposure in an environment with the best studio mics possible? The, the history of the, the, and the legacy of Grateful Dead engineering, it, you're just not gonna find that anywhere else. Well, the way I look at it, Bobby, is, and again, I, you know, it's where you choose to spend the money. I right. think most bands waste money in the studio. They waste money on the road. They waste money, you know, in things that are, you know, they have publicists, they have managers um, that are very, very expensive. And to me, you know, we don't happen to have a manager, and that allows us to have live video at every single show because the cost is about the same for the course of the year. So I think for new bands, it's all about where you want to spend the money. And uh, I'm with Chris, you know, you know, I mean, you're not selling your own studio very hard, but uh, personally, I found it was, you know, an incredible That's experience. My and you say, you walk out with a great representation of your band when you're done. Well, a, a so band. Know, my advice to every young band is, look, save your pennies. Don't bother with a studio. Record at home on, uh, on, on GarageBand on your iPad. And then when you want to do something real, save your pennies, go up to TRI get a couple hours there, broadcast the thing out there, have the show when you're done, because that's a much better calling card. We can do that, or we can find somebody else to pay for it, <laughs> which is uh, what we're trying to do. Now, I th I th talking about managers, I thought Steve managed you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. come on. <laughs> Thanks, pal. That's really different. He only manages my, uh, you know, THC levels. Um, <laughs> he's, he's practicing right now for you, Roger. The, uh, you know, the thing that when we're all out there on the road, Bob, I mean, you still tour a lot with Further. You tour with your own bands and a variety of bands. Today you have uh, Scare the Children. And, you know, you've got a lot of projects going on now. And it seems to me that one of the things that TRI allows you to do is to do a lot of things at a really high level because you're not having to travel all the time well, to stay current with people. That was, that was, of course, one of the things that I, one of the reasons I built this place is I wanted to do something, you know, if, if, at the best quality that's available technically, technologically, that you can get. 
uh, at any given time, and right now we're there. Um, and at the same time, do something that I got into doing at home on a regular basis so I could stay home a little bit more, because I got a couple of kids now and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's kind of working that, in that direction for me. So when you're, when you're sitting there tonight doing this show, right, what are the big issues you face every day? Because there's still entertainment lawyers out there who want to get you to pay to put things in an archive. What are the issues you deal with day to day running the studio? Maybe this is a question for Chris. Yeah. Um, because all of us are going to face this as we go out there. If you play somebody else's songs, you broadcast it, whatever it is. You know, there are lots of intellectual property issues that, if you will, um, remain to be tested in this new era. Well, that's a really good point, and we, we get a lot of, of questions on Facebook and Twitter. Can you repost this? I missed it. Can you repost it? The thing is, actually, we can't because it is so ridiculously expensive to, if you play a cover song to get a sync license. It's not a mechanical rate where it's been set, the standard's been set at a certain amount of pennies per play, but you have to go and negotiate with whoever owns the publishing each time you want to do it, figure out what that rate's going to be, and it's completely arbitrary. There is no market, no standard has been set. And that's, that's the big push-pull right now, is the exposure of a, wh whatever artist playing a cover of whatever song to how many people are going to watch it worth uh, worth, worth it to the band to give it gratis or for a de minimis fee, or are you going to try to make up all the royalties that you got screwed out of in 1950 in this one sync license right now? We would love to replay everything all the time and fill up the archive. We just simply can't because we don't own the publishing rights to so many of the songs we play. Sooner or later, I think all that's going to get worked out. But I think it's yeah. going to take and a while. Maybe this is the antidote to everybody being a tribute band, right? Because if you write your own songs, you don't have that problem. Yeah, if you own your publishing, we'll play it all day long. Thank you very much, as long as it's good. But I, I think the, the main thing that people get out of here is what you see is completely unscripted, pretty much unrehearsed, and just having a lot of fun in here. And that's what bands really get blown away. They come in and... It's not like a normal TV show or performance. It's really us making it up as we go along. And we'll continue to do that as long as it serves the art. Well, to me, as a fan, as well as a performer, I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. I mean, the thing we've all learned over the years is that when you go to a show, one of the things you really want to do is own the recording of the shows you went to. And, you know, when people get to see an artist in some setting that isn't just a standard show or isn't just a recorded album where you actually meet the real person that's worth 10 times you know getting to watch a normal music video well getting to see steve Parrish on the couch and bob talk about <laughs> you know talk about life on the road and hearing those great stories that's worth its weight in gold well, and I get to spend about 20 hours a week on the bus with Steve, so I have a huge advantage. I get to hear a lot more of those stories. <laughs> but I should just want to win a story. And I yeah, but over. we get to hear the rebuttal. That's the whole thing. We get to call bullshit. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, well, we don't have anybody to do that on our bus. But <laughs> so, um, so, Bob, talk a little bit about your musical endeavors. Everybody out here is a fan. Bring us up to speed. What's going on with Further? What's going on with Scare the Children? What's going on with Rat Dog? Bring us up to speed. Well, okay. Further is uh, is proceeding at a full racing trundle right now. Um, we'll be playing. Christ, when are we playing? Well, I guess in Red a, Rocks, September Red Rocks. Well, in, in Seattle, September Oregon. we start playing for. Uh, we we have a a festival in uh, Interlochen, Virginia. Interlochen, Virginia, right? Uh, and I, I don't know exactly when that is, but you can look it up. Is the Interlochen Festival? Interlochen, September seventh, eighth, and ninth. And then, uh, then shortly after that, we'll be doing a tour in the western states. And then, uh, what is it? Uh, well, I'm I'm doing a a, a show with uh, Weekend After Next in Pennsylvania with with Rat Dog. We're gonna we the Peach uh, Festival, huh? The Peach Festival. Peach Festival, right? With uh, with Rat Dog. Oftentimes, I do uh, solo solo touring with just me and a guitar. Generally speaking, I bring out somebody else and with their guitar, and we uh, 
we have a lot of fun doing that. I'm also working on a symphony project that I, the first half of which I debuted a, a couple of years back with uh, Marin Symphony Orchestra. Um, we're working with a bigger orchestra, uh, you know, a more prestigious orchestra now. And uh, that's kind of got me hopping. It's, it's, that's an exciting project. I also just played with, uh, with Warren Haynes and the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. Um, uh, like three or four nights back, um, mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun. He's he's got a, a symphonic project, obviously that he's trotting around right now. Um, Whoever would have thought it? Huh? Grateful Dead by the Symphony. That's that's different. Well, was it fun? Did you like playing with the symphony? Huh? Did you like playing with? Did you like playing with the symphony? It's. I mean, whole... did you ever think you were going to do that as a kid? I mean, you're sitting there, you know, in the late '60s, where you saying to yourself, "My goal in life is to play at Symphony Hall in San Francisco." Well, I tell you what, as I've often said before, uh, every every artist of every stripe is first and foremost a storyteller, and if you can flush out the story um, sonically <laughs> for for yourself while you're performing the the character that you're 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 letting come through you just gets more and more vivid and the song becomes bigger now that can be done with a good band or that can be done with a symphony orchestra and uh, it takes a little work getting a symphony to do that we're working right now on trying to on on techniques to get uh, symphony to uh, to improvise for instance which I think we're going to be able to do. And this is kind of exciting. And also, we're, with our piece, we're, we're going to be extending, we're going to be exploring some of, uh, some of our old chestnuts, the ones that we used to explore, and exploring some of the ones that we didn't use to explore, taking them for a little walk in the woods, as, you know, stating the theme and taking it for a little walk in the woods like we always used to do. So that's, that's fun, and it's richly rewarding. So tell, that, I mean, that really does sound like an amazing thing. Was there like one song that when you were playing with Warren that you sat there while you were playing it with the symphony where you went, holy shit, that song really works in a symphonic setting? There were a bunch Everybody of them. Everybody told me Terrapin was really great. I don't know what you liked best. I don't know what I liked best either. It was, it was all a lot of fun. I, you know, when I'm on stage, I'm really not there. You're not, you know, I, 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 look my, I look like me, but I'm not. Um, I'm somebody else, and, and, and oftentimes when I step away from that, I, I, I know I used to be able to know whether or not I enjoyed it, but now, now the more I get into the characters of the, of the, of the songs, um, when I step away from that character, I really, I'm not there anymore. I can't tell you. Yeah. yeah. So today we're going to get to hear from Scare the Children. Scaring the children. And yeah. I don't know how many. I don't know how many of the people who are watching today are familiar with this band, but you've got a tremendous group that has played off and on for many years. Tell us about Scare the Children, how it got started, who's playing today, and what you guys are going to do. Okay, it's it's scaring the children, and it's basically. Um, how many times has the name changed? Chris and I went back and forth on this as to what what it was called today. It right? has always been called Scaring the Children. <laughs> Hey, Chris, take a note of that, okay? <laughs> you don't listen, Roger. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, what we got is the old original core for Rat Dog that uh, I, I started out with before we were scaring the children, or right when we were scaring the children, before we turned into Rat Dog, actually. And, uh, and that's Jay Lane on drums, on drums, Rob Wasserman on upright bass. Um, and then uh, we added a few years later in Rat Dog, we added, added Jeff Comenti in, uh, on, on keyboards, on piano and keyboards. And he's going to be with us this evening. And then we also have our special guest this evening in, uh, in young Lucas Nelson. Outstanding. Yeah. So tell us, tell us a little bit about, you know, is this a, a project you're going to be doing a lot of, or is this just a project we're hanging out for a little bit on? What's the... This is just a one night stand. Tell us what's going on. I tell you what, I love doing this. 
We're, we got our best guys on it. Tonight it's all for you, Roger. All for you. Right. And, and the fun. gentle listeners and viewers out there in the uh, in forever, forever festival uh, land. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we have an award presentation, do we not? Oh, my goodness. That we're going to be making to Bob? Indeed we do. Do I get hardware? You won't believe this, but we're going to, at a distance, present you with an award for the exceptional leadership that you've shown so far in with TRI, what you're trying to do in making people aware of what musicians can do to both extend their art in new and better ways, but also to bring fans together in ways that I think make the world a better place. Yes, and uh, thank you so much for participating in this, in this festival, Bob, and actually uh, headlining tonight. And I, uh, Chris, good to see you. Thanks for helping us set this up. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm Carl Rogers, CEO of IROC, and uh, this is our Forever Festival, and uh, just excited you guys were able to make it down. Uh, <laughs> In my capacity as one of the founders of the Live Digital Music Association, I'd like to present you, Bob Weir, with the Sound and Vision Award for 2013. It's our inaugural award. It's a kind of an eyeball, coggy-looking thing. It's supposed to represent sound and vision, which you've had clearly for many, many decades, going from uh, getting kids hip to live taping to getting kids hip to live streaming. and. Uh, in many ways, the world is still catching up to you, Bob. You put in the ground up there at TRI to do something big about five years ago. And uh, we're just getting hip to it. So thanks to being a part of our festival. Yeah. Well, okay, well, thank you. Thank thanks, you. Guys. Um, I'm humbled and I'm honored. And that'll, that'll look real nice on my desk over here. You want to swing that over there? <laughs> The desk. The next we, you'll be seeing that later. I can swing it back. Well, thank you. I don't want to get in the way of Bob and a performance in this crowd here, so uh, I think we're ready to jam. If you're ready to jam, we're ready to jam. Time for TRI Rock. Oh. Right. <laughs>
the house. There we go. You're going to notice. You're going to notice that we we probably we ran we ran a lot of these tunes uh, earlier today, but <laughs> as I recall, we didn't work out a single ending. So you're going to see all that happening live, right in front of your eyes. <laughs> What's up next? Oh, call me the breeze. Oh, that's for, that's for, this is for JJ Kale. <laughs> Oh 
everybody loves a polka. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Flies and children on the street And I catch a glimpse of black-eyed girls Who giggle when I smile There's a little boy He wants to shine my feet And it's three days ride from Bakersfield And I don't know why I came I guess I came to keep them and do
Cause I shot first and killed him Oh Lord, he didn't even draw Now I spend my lifetime running With the mix of Cali Blue yeah. Is there anything a man don't stand to do When he lets his woman hold him in her hand You just might find yourself out there On horseback in the dark Just riding and running across those desert sands something you will never know Don't you touch hard liquor Just a cup of cold coffee Gonna get up in the morning and go Everybody praying 
drinking that wine I can tell the queen of diamonds by the way she shines No chance of losing this time.
go down cut to the couch. like crows on a fence um, and we're gonna <laughs> oh, we racist. have no idea there we go we there we go so here we are uh, let's see well Steve? welcome to we're here all of you freaks and fellow travelers we got to say that yeah, just regular folks you know in case there are any regular folks like uh, uh, this is a celebrated dr. Barlow joining us tonight the learned dr. Barlow and uh, and Steve, I thought, uh, yeah, this, this is Steve Parrish. Also uh, learned it in his way. Yes, a street doctor. Yeah, street doctor. Um, now, Steve is uh, celebrated in his own right. He's uh, the illustrious manager of uh, Roger McNamee's yeah. outfit, uh, Moon Alice. The band that, the band that hey, some yeah. claim have, has no manager. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm glad you busted him at that, because right, we not right. only have one, but we got two and three managers at times. <laughs> <laughs> because I have to be managed, and they got to be managed, and everybody manages each other. But uh, it'd be sweet if bands could go down the road without that. I mean, because we know that only certain of us super geniuses can do that. You see, it's very delicate work. Because uh, you also have to, you know, be a doctor, a psychiatrist, and a surgeon. And, a, and, a, and an astrophysicist. And a, right. and a codependent. And an astrophysicist. And codependent, <laughs> exactly. And you have to be, you know, uh, I mean, I've operated on Bob. He's operated on me. We, we met, I think the three of us met in, in the orphanage when we were babies. And they, right. they threw us in a big uh, basket together. You always want to just drop that whole thing about the Turkish prison. Well, no, yeah, I'm sorry. For, um, your folks met in a Turkish prison. I remember that. <laughs> 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 the truth of the matter is that uh, we were all miscreants. Uh, now, look that up later. Well, but we found each other in life. Thought to be miscre miscreants. No, actual. 
And, uh, okay. you know, we're really shocked right now that everybody else in the world is discovering that everything you do is not private, because we always knew that. Yeah, and, and, and a large number of people are claiming that they don't mind that everything they do is not private because <laughs> yeah. they're not miscreants. Right, they, they don't have their mind <laughs> wrapped around what the history of What they don't seem to realize is that just about yes. everybody is doing something that somebody else doesn't like. Right. And we don't care about that, see? That's what makes us miscreants to certain people, yep. not everybody. But if yep. you're a miscreant who's not a miscreant, then you should be. They think, well, it's okay, I'm not a terrorist. But you know, that little news story sure? that might, yeah, no, well, actually I am a terrorist, but I mean, <laughs> I'm talking about what other people think. How uh, you perceive. Mister, yeah, you're they, scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I, I, I remember so. how we tried to uh, talk but, you out of that, but I, I, him. I, you know, one of the things I read, I've obviously been following the NSA's uh, Omni surveillance pretty closely. Right. And, uh, I've just spent probably 10 hours with Julian Assange in the last few weeks trying to figure out how to help. Now, how do you think I feel about that, John? How, no, how you're, you're, you you're, you're that? hanging with Julian Assange, and uh, every time I call yeah, you... You're hanging, and you're hanging with Eric. And, and I call, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I call you, the so... Deal? I know uh, damn well that the, NS, the NSA is listening to every word certainly. we're saying. Of course, yeah, thank but, you. And yeah, but the thing is that they're listening to every word that every other person is saying. The thing... But they always here's the, on us Here's anyway. the deal. They just realized, out of some combination of laziness and economy, that it was easier to get to capture all of it right. and, and, right. Let, and, let, and let God sort it. it out. I mean, this is kind of like the principle that if you're looking for needles, the first thing you want to do is to build a much bigger haystack. Well, yeah, and it's not <laughs> like we weren't mentioned of, in right, FBI and, and, reports. And, 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 and they were getting it wrong all I'm, I don't know if you ever got your FBI report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, did I? No, oh, I didn't. I, do, do it again. I, I've seen it, yours. Because do it again. It, it, it's, it's fascinating because, yeah, they know stuff, but almost everything they know is wrong. Well, they tapped our phone at the studio at Front Street once. You know, we oh, got right, a right. letter about that. That was due to some of our notorious friends that we were hanging out with. And, um, and they on were the genuinely road, notorious. And they, uh, ever since we've been on the road, they, they have kept watch of us, you know. So we knew that. We lived yeah. our lives open and in the open, and we never had anything to hide. No, I mean, I, I've been... I know, got plenty I've been, I've been actively well, yeah. involved in... But you always say we don't. In, uh, we yeah, don't yeah. In, I was actively involved in getting Snowden to make, the, to make those statements. I was actively involved in getting the leaks out. I don't don't worry about it. I know, I've been leading my <laughs> life completely up in the open, and I you know I was entering the United States yesterday, and I thought, well, this could be that moment where, nah, it's not going to oh, be. Oh well, a couple of times so, <laughs> I, I want to talk about entering the United States. One time we were over in Europe, and we were going through customs, and Weir goes, a kid had the first uh, Halliburton suitcase. You remember this? We were at customs in Amsterdam. And Bobby goes, check him, check him. He's got something in that bag. And they not, they they ripped the lining out of kids' suitcases Aww. just to see what was in there. But Kreutzmann, one time, we were going through uh, customs in England. And remember, the guy had piled up all of our bags. I mean, every one of, we had 50 bags, easy, on this one cart. And we're walking through customs. And, what, and Billy's bag was on the bottom of the pile, right? So he yells to the custom guy, this is something you don't do. He says, ha ha, there's the bottom. I guess you're not going to touch it. They took that car apart, took his bag, took him in the room, stripped him, put all our bags back on and let us go, kept him for detention. Well, there's a big difference between living completely in the open and then taunting them about it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and we taunted them. We and taunted them. You know, it's fun, but you know, it can be but, fun for them, too, you see. Well, in the FBI right, they, report, Those guys have got to have a little fun every now and absolutely. then. Absolutely, and, 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 and they can really we make it good. at your expense. We right. look good in FBI reports. You know, they liked putting a name of, of famous bands in there, and they had exaggerations yeah, no, about true. This is actually a very important point. The FBI, in a funny way, they're star fuckers. They like yes, dropping they names. It. Because we, I, we, when we love get, to drop uh, names. mentioned, we, we brought it to lawyers, and they said, this is a novel. you got to look yeah, at this yeah, like a yeah, novel, and true. you guys are in there. And they would say outrageous stuff, especially about Owsley and us and, and all that, and we weren't up to nothing. Just Why bother nice to say something outrageous about Owsley when the truth would serve? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the headlines in the papers said it all when we would go out, you know? But, um, you no, know... But the, the thing is... Uh, oh, they wow. don't. Ha they don't have the yeah. ability to use this stuff. They have. They have very small capacity for turning data into information. But and they it, want to see. And it's it getting all, worse though. instead of better. But the problem is that at a certain point, they could decide that they really want. That they had the tools and they had the interest 
and they wanted to be able to, to focus on any number of people. And with a very slight change in the system, they would be able to get after you for anything at all. Sure. You know, and so at the moment, the NSA is being run by people that I actually think are relatively good people. I mean, they, th they well, think about you? the... Well, well no, I know you? these. No, I well, know them. I mean, it, Does that make I, you on their side or ours? I'm, I, I'm well, a double agent. Keep going. I'm a double agent, which is fine. Me too. Uh, Perfect. But, but well-documented. It could easily... Be, be run by people that don't care about the Constitution. Well, and, and then put, where, where would you put this context in? I, we were at the Continental Hyatt House one time, and... That's uh, a criminal thing right my, there. My girlfriend thought that we were up to this huge party in my room, and so she called me on the old-fashioned... Remember when phones yeah. in hotels, we had to pick them up? And Bob, I left my door ajar, and I was telling her, no, honey, nothing's going on. And now, mean, Bob, meanwhile, let me, let me back up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Our trucks had gone through... Uh, through the vast open spaces, uh, North Dakota, right. Wyoming, all those those uh, vast open spaces, they have a lot of fireworks stands in those, <laughs> in those yes. places, in, in those states, because, you know, because... Yeah, guys, why not? You know, there's nothing to light on fire. And, uh, and so they kind of loaded up. <laughs> and I was into smoking cigars at that point. God, I'm glad that... Passed. And so here's a... Uh, I'm walking by Steve's room, and he's on the phone talking to his girlfriend. And I'm just, you know, I'm just across the hall, something like that. So I just go into my room, and I grab a wedge of firecrackers, you a know. Mat, a whole mat. <laughs> a big brick, you know. And uh, <clears throat> they were big, big puppies, too, the thunder bombs, they, they were called. And so I, I, I go back to Steve's room, I knock on the door to get his attention. <laughs> Swings open and uh, and he's sitting on the on the bed, and uh, and I show him the cigar and I show him the uh, wedge of firecrackers with the fuse sticking out and I and then I close the door and put my feet up against it like this. You know, and held exactly. hand, and suddenly held Chinese handle. New Year's in your no, room. Well, the thing and was he did do that. He put his feet up and I couldn't budge the door right. So I refused to give him the satisfaction of killing me, but I tried to act totally calm. And I'm telling the young lady on the phone, nothing's going on, dear. I'm telling you. And, and it sounded like I was in a firefight. And so I tried to be <laughs> you were cool. Trying, you were trying to tell her that th that wasn't going on? Well, she heard it. And she said, yeah, right. And she, she hung up. And so I'm stuck <laughs> yeah. in the room. He's still up there like this on the door holding it. He, I don't know how you did it, but you stayed there a long time. Well, I every time. Budget. Every time one of them went off, the door would bulge a little <laughs> and until I was finally it was, it was just ah, and the door stopped bulging because it True. couldn't go back fast. It must have enough. come out looking like Wiley e. Coyote well, after, that was exactly after a, it. an encounter well, with the, the Acme was, company. He wasn't giving up, and I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of letting him know that I was suffocating. <laughs> then there was no air in the room after by about half of that mat going off. So I had to, you know, remember, you know the windows where you turn the little things and you get about that crack of air? Right. That's how it was at the Hyatt House in L.A. It so made it hard to throw a TV out the window. Exactly. I smashed the windows out, and then he still wouldn't open the door. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> well, then my carpet was I would smash the windows ruined. out, make him want to open the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, good. I thought he would take mercy on me. But the, the entire carpet was burnt like a mat of firecrackers went off on it, right? <laughs> and thank God in those days we got the bill for 200 bucks. We were lucky. But he, he, he uh, Bob did hear me, and it was the thing. I had violated the code. I was lying on a phone where somebody heard me. So if you so lie, it's okay on to lie phone, on the phone as long as nobody heard. Exactly. So, so now is it's, a lie a lie. Are you, are you nobody telling hears me it. that it's now not okay to lie on the phone for anybody? Since no, I think we should lie all, all phone the calls time are now. Like oh, every well. time I call you, I'm going to go Alpha Six. Meet me on the corner and not. I thought that was time. always the rule. Well, yeah, but well, now we can really do it because think of what we could play with. I mean, we, we know code that they don't know, jive that they can't jive. And if we do that, <laughs> then we're going to have them right. running crazy because a guy like you is a perfect guy to help us put the blame Be on. Absolutely. Okay, we got to wrap this up. Uh, this More this music, particular yeah. cast, uh, we're, uh, the deal here is that we're going to say goodbye to the folks at the, uh, at the Forever, Forever Festival because... You guys are cutting to something else. Well, we're going to keep Bye going forever. here. 
And uh, so <laughs> bye some of you, and, and uh, some of you just uh, hello again um, in just a minute. <laughs>
and you who choose to lead must follow but if you fall but if you fall alone if you should stand then who's to
Okay. <laughs> we're on again. Hey. And we're welcoming to the couch for, uh, is this the first time, your first time on the couch? Yeah, this is my first time. Ooh, oh, boy. boy. Well, Sooner or later, yeah, all, we got all roads. traditions. Uh, I mean, he. That's my out. We're Here cherry, and currently popped. Well, you are, no, no, you've got your family. You are total family to us. I mean, we bonded with your dad a long time ago, and the way that started was uh, Jackson, who worked on our crew, he was a nut for Waylon Jennings. And so first we did a couple of shows with Waylon, and then he introduced us to your dad, and then the three of us joined up and did some touring together. And those were some great shows. And we all mingled and mixed like you wouldn't believe, man. It was like we were all cut from the same stock. And we would go, we ended up in Grateful Dead, we ended up for two Thanksgivings in a row. Remember that, Bob? In Texas, you oh, know? Yeah, yeah. And so they would treat us so good. We were lucky enough to end up, one time we were in San Antonio, and that was something else. But we ended up <laughs> in uh, Austin, and they laid, we had Thanksgiving with, your dad and his people, Pooty, everybody at the Armadillo World Headquarters. It was cool. It was and really it was cool. great. And then I think Leon Russell came over and was sitting in and playing, and Jerry was jamming with your dad. And we were just, you know, all hanging out. And we all liked the same party items, and we had a lot of fun. Now, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, your dad smoked pot with us, okay? I didn't want to break that to you. <laughs> And then he used to always come visit us. If he if he crossed paths with us, he would come and see us in Chicago, wherever we were, we'd see him. Yeah. But I remember one time we uh, we played with your dad at one of his uh, picnics. This was in Kansas City, yep. I remember. Yep. And we played in Arrowhead Stadium. We did the thing in Arrowhead Stadium, and I remember it being maybe the hottest gig I've ever done. Now, we played in Egypt. We played in places where it gets up there. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> they have... They had, at least at the time, I think they still do, they had artificial turf, you know, dark green plastic. Huh. It was like 108 and 95 de yep. degrees humidity. And so on the field, the, the temperature on the field where the people were sitting was 135 degrees and humid. <laughs> and uh, it was god It was brutal. Awful. It was a brutal day. Wow. And until, until it clouded up and it, uh, it was... Glorious to behold, I went up to the back of the stadium to, to watch. Your dad was on by that time, and the clouds were uh, just building up, and then finally they, they let loose. They cut loose the kind of rain you expect to see fish swimming by. It, it pouring, was, so it started pouring down. Oh, pouring, Big you know. They, they, he, it's funny how the weather uh, like reacts and interacts with my dad. <laughs> it's, I've, Not surprised. I, I've been to shows where he'll... Start singing about, um, I can't remember what song it was, but he mentioned the rain. And the second he said rain, it fell. And you know, if you do, <laughs> if you put as much time in on the road, playing outdoors and stuff like that as your dad or we have, yeah. that's going to happen. Yeah. There were so many times that we'd do uh, looks like rain and it open yeah. up. or. Uh, yeah, there was a time you were doing Fire on the Mountain in Portland and uh, Mount St. Right. Helens blew Thank up. you. Oh, man. <laughs> right, that was really... That, that, was, was, that, that actually that happened, was folks. That was, that was real. Yeah. Th that blew our minds. But yeah, it would be Here <laughs> Comes Sunshine. Here Comes Sunshine. The, uh, you know, the, 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 you know and it would be cloudy and uh, the, we'd you know, get to that to that line. Right here comes there. sunshine. Yeah. The, the sun would come through. And everybody goes nuts. It almost makes you want to think about like when George Harrison was singing, "Here comes the sun." If that, that I'm sure that happened to him too. Oh yeah. You know, you just here comes the sun. The clouds open and up. Got it. Religious. You know. Right. You know, you, I don't know whether you were old enough to remember this guy. Uh, did you ever meet Peter Sheridan? He was, oh. Oh. He was your dad's bodyguard. Well, you know what? I told. Dad, about the story that you told yeah, me and, and, about and he, Peter Sheridan, because yeah, I know, I don't, I know about. What did he say Peter about that? Sweet. Oh, Pete. he laughed and he said, "Yeah, that's probably how it happened." Well, he said, the, "Actually, yeah. he told me that a story about another story about Peter was that when Peter first came onto his bus, Peter's this big biker, the, the craziest guy. person. He, uh, what crazy. you say we call him, we call yeah. him crazy. Would you say that he's the craziest person you ever met? Yeah, we yeah. called him crazy. Well, yeah, but, no, but, but crazy. Willie called him Sweet Pete. Yeah, Willie well, the thing, is, Pete. the thing is, what happened is he, he this was this biker guy looking for a fight, you know, oh, yeah. so drunk, we comes, him out comes up to the bus and and scares the shit out of everybody, fights his way onto the bus, and it's only my dad on the bus, and he's got this pie, dad's got this pie sitting on his table. 
for some reason, a fan gave him a pie. So Peter Sheridan just sits down. He's got a bottle of whatever. He sits down next to Dad and just, like, stares him down like he's ready, ready to go for it. And Dad, thinking this was his only chance to really do something <laughs> that, that, like, he's either going to get in a fight or, or be this guy's best friend. So he picks up the pie and slams it right in his face. Perfect. Exactly the right move. <laughs> exactly the right move. And they were best friends. That's so. why, yeah. But, and, but yeah. He, you know, it was, it was, and he was a good bodyguard from the standpoint nobody wanted to fuck with your dad yeah. as long as Peter was standing yeah. there. Yeah. Nobody wanted well, to fuck yeah. with Peter. Sure. And, but at one point, at the story I, that he's referring to, uh, somebody had sent me a whole bunch of liquid LSD. And, <laughs> and, and Willie was playing in Jackson. And I came up mostly to visit Peter. Uh, and I was sitting in the room, and he said, you got, I was talking about this acid, and he said, let me see it. And he gets it out, and he puts a drop of acid that would stun an elephant on his hand, rolling it around. And Willie just walked in the room, and, and Peter says, Willie, lick my hand. <laughs> and he did. Yeah. And hours later, after he'd regained the power of speech, I said, you know, I, Peter's a friend of mine, but I, you know, I'm not sure I'd keep him around. Why, why did you hire him? And he said, well, sometimes he lets me lick his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first time we met Sheridan was at the Capitol Theater in Porchester, and he was so high, he had taken so much LSD that he was just laying out in the floor between the dressing rooms and the stage, laughing for the whole four hours the Grateful Dead played. And we kept stepping over him. And then he showed up at Marina, remember Marina Winer? Right, oh, yeah. We used to party at that place. She was and the heiress to the Thompson submachine yeah. gun fortune. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. And some oil wells, <laughs> yeah, too. That's right. but, and, the, you know, the, the karma in that family was a little, a little it rusty. was pushing it. It was rusty. <laughs> but they over, their place overlooked uh, Gracie Mansion, which was the mayor of New York's home. And I think we threw groceries off onto his lawn for half the night. But Peter, your dad, after Peter died on his motorcycle, uh, your dad started doing angel flying too close to the ground. And I always thought he did that for Peter, you know, but um, there were some people that your father hung out with that were quite characters. You know that. Because one day when we were on the road, I looked out. Uh, we stayed in Holiday Inns in those days, right? And Paul English, who was his drummer at the time, was rolled. He had something rolled up, and he was putting it on the bus, right? A big piece of carpet. What he used to do when he got in the hotel room He'd take his buck knife and go six inches under the bed and cut the piece of carpet out and bring it out, roll it up. And they always stayed in Holiday Inns. It was the same green all the time. Mm -hmm. And he, his studio was wall-to-wall -wall carpeted from carpeted from those pieces. And nobody ever found them because no maid in the Holiday Inn ever vacuumed under the bed. So they never noticed. And he was smart enough to go six inches in. So... We would learn stuff from them, and we trade little secrets like that. Paul of the road. Is, and is and remains to me, was and remains to me one of the coolest oh, yeah. people I've ever Great met. Man. Uh, Great man. Everybody in that band is and was really cool. Uh, you know, B Spears is another good guy. He just passed away a few years back, uh -huh. and he was one of the, I mean, just an insane bass player, so musical. Great. Kind of like Rick Rick Danko, you know, just had that whole but vibe. But he wasn't yeah. as crazy as Rick was. No, it, B was, was yeah. crazy. B was crazy, man. B well, was insane. You can't oh. be on the road for years and years yeah, living, in a, right. I, living, okay. on, living on a bus. Living on a bus is a lot like crazy. living on a submarine. Yeah, you know, he, B Spears was, <laughs> was one of the funniest people I've ever met. He One time he, uh, I was like five years old six years old and he took us we went out to we were in australia with dad and he took us to the zoo oh. and we were with the kangaroos and he 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 was trying to make us laugh he would put the kangaroo food in his mouth and he would let the kangaroo eat the food out of his mouth and he's this old redneck guy just going, right. oh, yeah. <laughs> making out with a kangaroo and we thought it was the best thing in the world <laughs> glorious photo op yeah, I'm surprised. I'm sure there's a photo somewhere of that. There's got to be. I, I was one time, I, I took a, I went into the Central Park Zoo. This was a long time ago. I was in my late teens or early 20s. I think it was my first uh, trip to New York. Went to the Central Park Zoo, and I got a, a you know, you a were big 20. box of popcorn. Were you there with me? We went to the bear cage? Yeah. And the big, you know, the, 
I don't know what they were thinking, but the bear cage was just some <laughs> cyclone fencing. That the, <laughs> it was it was more like advanced chicken wire fencing. <laughs> and and the kids on one side and the bears on the other. And the, the kids and the bears had made short work of that. There were holes in it and stuff like that. So I saw this bear in there, and we locked eyes. And uh, well, you know, he sees me eating the popcorn. He, I, it was clear to me that he wanted some of that. So I, I, I come up to him, sticks his paw out a little bit, and I get, he, he got his paw out, right? And I, I these, gave him a little These popcorn. bears were kind of domesticated in a New York bear kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> they knew they weren't going anywhere from such right. a part. Wow. So we were going back and forth, and I was feeding him popcorn, and we, we, you know, at one point he wrapped his tongue all the way around my arm a couple of times. Now, what you don't realize is bears are, are related to anteaters, um, but they've got long, long tongues for... They're made for getting the, the honey or the ants or whatever out of the, the very bottom of the stump. So he wrapped his his tongue around my arm like a barber pole, and then and That's then an retracted it slowly, and looking at me all the time like, "How's that for you, huh? How's that for you?" We were we were having a lot of fun. I, you know, ran out of popcorn, and he was a little upset about that. I showed him, "Hey, listen." Look, empty, you can see for yourself. And he, he wanted the, the uh, you know, then we started having little back and forth, you know, we I'd grab his paw and I'd pull his paw out, and then he'd pull my paw back, uh, you know, just, I'm a little stronger than you are, you are, dude. But we had a lot a lot of fun. Then I had to go, I think I had a gig. You remember this? And I, well, I'm, I'm you know, I remember the bear incident. I, I'm, tell, I'm really trying to find the tongue in there. But oh, he did. <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll take I'll tell your you word man. for it. But yeah, I, I remember it. I remember it real well. <laughs> yeah, I can see why you might. Uh, anyway, I had a gig, and he. Wait a minute. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He had a. I had a gig. I had to go. I had to leave. I had to tell the bear, "Listen, dude, I'm out of here. I uh, got a gig. Sorry about that." He he really kicked up kicked up a fuss when uh, when I was leaving. Anyway, young Lucas here is going to wrestle a bear at, uh, uh, live in front of a whole bunch of folks at Candlestick Park right after he sings the national at anthem on Friday AT &T, night. AT&T, yeah. Huh? It's called AT&T Park. AT&T yeah. Park. Yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. AT&T Park you, you, at a you know Giants about this? game. Uh, yeah, no, I knew about it, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, they don't want to... They told me a couple days ago. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he sings the national anthem, and then he wrestles the bear, and then the winner of that gets to throw out the first pitch. <laughs> And oh, they'll love you. They'll love you. I didn't know bears could throw pitches, but they're going to have to. <laughs> well, I didn't know they could wrap their tongue three times around your wrist. Because <laughs> well, I can't fight a bear, I know. You, you, I it's know. time to start strategizing. Yeah, well, well you know, the I, I do. You know, I could, I could probably coax it into submission somehow. <laughs> Good, it's obvious brave they're lad. counting on you brave winning lad. this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, yeah, i got to throw that pitch. Okay, we're wrapping this up. We're getting the old... It's really nice to see you, by the way. You too, man. Very nice. Yeah, thanks a lot.
told I'll see I was feeling
Just like a little child Clouds make daisy chains So let me see you smile again Dear Prudent Won't you let me see Won't you come out to play? Dear Prudence, come greet the brand new day.